Hello everyone. It's been a terribly long time, hasn't it? I have had yet another cold, and though I'm not quite through with it, I'll try to get through this article as best as I possibly can. So please forgive me if my voice sounds even less endearing than in the other articles. Today we are going to deal with the sound effector. I'm sure many of you have anxiously been awaiting this. Before we start, let me give you one warning. This topic is going to be rather dry and involves a lot of espresso, so if you're not really feeling that awake, I suggest you get another cup of coffee. I know that you may wonder why, but trust me, a lot of the power of the sound effector can only be revealed by linking it with espresso to other tools. Before working with audio, no matter in which program, it is paramount that you make sure that the sound files are actually usable for your purposes. Therefore, the first step should always be to check them in an audio editing program. I'm using Adobe's Audition here. I have opened one of the files we are going to use throughout this article. This is a piece composed by Chris Hilsbeck, who is mostly known for his soundtrack on the famous Turrican series of games. This particular title is the intro of another game where he also scored the soundtrack. Of course, I have prepared the file before. It looks alright. When you look at the peaks, you can see that all of them are very distinct and none of them get clipped. This is most important. Any peaks that get clipped are gone forever and thereafter you cannot use your file sensibly anymore because all the differentiation between the sounds is gone. So watch out and try to maintain that distinctiveness throughout all your processing. What you should look for in particular is that there are noticeable differences between the maximum and minimum peaks. Regardless of how well your audio file may be extracted or recorded, you may not be able to get distinct sounds in certain frequency bands. This can for instance happen if you want to use a bass drum, but this bass drum gets overpowered by other instruments. The same for snare drums, cymbals and other sound effects that you will be looking for most of the time. Usually you are not interested in the melodic parts of a theme, but are looking for the rhythms which are defined by percussionist instruments. To make them more pronounced, you can use any number of effects. Now I have to admit that I myself not am very good at audio processing. I have a hearing deficiency on both ears and beyond that, I never really had much interest in learning an instrument or composing my own music. So please, any of you more experienced users, forgive me for everything I'm doing wrong. One of the simplest to understand tools is the graphic equalizer. It splits our audio file in separate frequency bands and by means of sliders allows you to change the intensity of each of these frequency bands. The simple rule here is to start with as few bands as you possibly can, in our case 10. Then we hit the preview playback button within the effects panel and start moving sliders. In this example I'm looking to boost the bass, so I'm putting that slider up and pulling the others down. If you are unable to isolate a certain frequency you need, simply use more bands. When I have found a suitable setting, I can apply my effect. You can see that our peaks have changed noticeably. Now against my initial advice, I have boosted my frequency so much that my audio is too loud and gets clipped. In this particular case, that's not a problem of course. We have only used one frequency band, more or less, and we are not going to hear much else anyways. However, you should at least do your ears a favor. One important step, regardless of whether you isolate frequencies or work with the original file, is to normalize your audio. This will push all maximum peaks below a certain level and thus prevent your loudspeakers and the table they are standing on from vibrating too much. When you are done, simply save your processed file under a different name. Using this method, you should be able to isolate any frequency you need. But let's not overdo. As you will see, the sound effector itself provides enough tools for controlling that. Another simple trick which you can employ with practically every audio file is to use the multiband compressor. A compressor is a tool that will enhance certain frequencies without completely destroying others. Usually this is used to make for instance spoken text more clear. If you are having a somewhat noisy or poorly recorded file, it can help you to make it more distinct. The nice thing about the multiband compressor is that it's fully interactive. Trust me, beyond the displays looking funky, I really don't know what the graphs are supposed to mean. I'm just pushing buttons and pulling sliders until it sounds nice to my ears. But hell, 
it gets the job done. And I don't think there's anything wrong with following such a simplistic approach. Before we are digging into the more exotic uses of the sound effector, let's take a look at its basic operation procedures. I've created a very simple setup involving a spline, a cloner, a cube and three effectors. Let's inspect how it all goes together. Because I want to affect the scale of the cube, I have converted it to a polygon object. This allows me to move the pivot point or axis anywhere I like and in my case I need it at the bottom of the cube. I've put this cube inside a cloner. The cloner itself is a simple linear cloner. To that cloner I have applied all three effectors. First of them is the random effector. It is only used to vary the scale of the cubes along the y-axis. The spline effector pins our cubes down onto our circular spline. Of course we could also have used the spline in our cloner object using the object mode, but by using effectors you are simply more flexible in case you need to change something. Lastly I have applied the sound effector. When I scrub or play the timeline you can see the effect of the sound effector. Our cubes are changing their scale in accord with the sound and they also change their color. So how is it all done? For a sound effector to do anything you need of course to load in a sound file. This is again a video game soundtrack from Sonic the Hedgehog. When you have imported the file you are not limited to having it play from the first frame. You can define a start offset so it plays later or by inputting a negative value you can have it play earlier so it has already started at frame zero. There are two different modes in which a sound effector can be applied. By default it's set to step. This will affect each clone individually and gives us the variation that you can see. However, you can also apply it to all clones uniformly. One thing not to forget is to adjust the fall off. When set to zero, your clones will fall back to their initial positions immediately. This doesn't look very realistic and in many cases can be way too fast. By increasing the value you can introduce some delay. This looks more natural. Next you can define a sampling mode. By default it is set to peak which is probably what you are going to use most of the time as it gives the most pronounced results. The average mode will interpolate different values between frequency bands and thus give less pronounced results. The third mode is the switch mode. This will turn on and off your clone parameters depending on a threshold. As you may have come to realize it's not that particularly useful when you are using geometry but imagine for instance you are using lights. Using the switch mode would turn them on and off. Once you have decided how to use your data it is time to tweak the settings how to use the audio file. The first slider defines a lower cutoff. This means that frequencies which do not reach a certain intensity will simply be ignored. So if you for instance have some very subtle background noises, you can eliminate those just by adjusting the slider. The next slider is probably the most important setting on the sound effector. By adjusting the compression, you can effectively increase the intensity of your output. Keep in mind that unlike our previous audio processing, this is fully dynamic and done in real time. It only happens on the end of Cinema 4D, but the audio file itself is not changed, so feel free to experiment with extreme values. Lucky for us, there's also a frequency graph that will show you what the audio file actually contains. This becomes important for the next settings. In order to only use certain frequency bands, you can use a filter shape. As you adjust your curve, your frequency graph will update accordingly. This should give you some idea what frequencies really affect your objects. When you reset the filter shape or pull all control points up to the top level, it will of course use all frequencies. There is also a frequency color gradient. Personally I see this more as a means of debugging my scene and finding out which clone is affected by which frequency. You can of course use it practically for your renderings as well, but unless you are doing equalizer like scenes all the time, it's not that terribly useful. For more control, simply use the shaders. Anyway, the gradient itself is fully interactive just like all the other tools and can be adjusted to your taste. As you would expect, there's also a choice which channel in your audio file you want to use. This really depends on what sounds you are using. Another way to limit the output to certain frequencies 
is the use filter option. Unlike our filter shape, it will pick a part of the frequency spectrum and remap it to all clones. If you are using a filter shape, it will still be used for all clones. You can adjust the filter frequency and the bandwidth interactively. In the frequency graph, this will be displayed as a light blue overlay. Lastly, there are two little options. The play button does exactly what it says. It will play the sound from beginning to end. This can be useful if you are using multiple sound effectors with different sounds in your scene. As you will see later, when doing so, you normally get some kind of feedback which completely messes up your sound. Playing your sound isolated will help you to find the right cue points. When you have done so, you may at some point get tired of hearing your sound all the time. That's what the scrub sound option is for. By simply disabling the check mark, the sound won't be played when you scrub through the timeline and you can work silently. This is also useful if you, like me, have neighbors that have a little child and you are working late at night and you don't want to disturb them. Okay, now with the simple stuff out of the way, let's move on to bolder things. As I warned you already, you are going to see the Expresso Editor window a lot from now on. So what do we have here? In my scene I have a simple sphere and a torus. Using two sound effectors, I'm driving certain aspects of their properties. Most notably, the radius of the sphere and the radius of the torus tube. When I change a few parameters on my sound effectors, you can see my scene reacting to it. So how is it all set up? When I'm working with Expresso, I prefer to have all my expressions on a separate nil object. This makes it easy to find them anytime and is much more preferable than having them inside a hierarchy. However, it doesn't really matter where you put your tags. This is more or less just a habit of good housekeeping. When linking effectors in Expresso, you should never ever link them directly. There is a special sample effector node for them and that's for a reason. When you are linking your effectors directly to other parameters, you will most likely end up with useless garbage. Only the sample effector node can make sense of the raw data it receives from an effector, so keep that in mind. To link your actual effector to the sample effector node, you simply drag and drop it inside the Expresso editor. By default it will have no ports enabled, so from the list choose object and link it to the effector input of the sample effector node. On that same node, we need of course the strength parameter, so we need to enable it as well. Then, again using drag and drop, pull the torus object inside the Expresso editor. Under its object properties, pick out its ring radius. Link the strength to the ring radius. We can now close the Expresso editor and take a look at our scene. As soon as we start to scrub our timeline, we see nothing. And why? Of course there must be something wrong. So what could it possibly be? When you look at our expression, you can see that we have linked the strength directly to the ring radius. By attaching a result node, we can see what values are coming out of our strength port. You see that they are only in ranges between 0 and 1. This is of course very very small compared to the rest of the scene. We need to fix that. The tool to use for that is the range mapper. We do not need to change the input upper and input lower values, but of course we want to change the output of the range mapper node. Twirl it up until you find a suitable value. With that the expression is complete. Now you can do some cleanup. We are using the same effector twice in our expression, which is a bit redundant. So let's take our range mapper and our torus object with the ring radius and let's move it below the other already connected objects. Delete the now superfluous nodes and relink everything to an already existing effector. As a last step, arrange all your node boxes so everything is neat and clean and you know what's going on should you need to go back to your expression and change things. As a second example, I have created a simple light grid. This time we are going to use a shader effector and a delay effector, in addition to our sound effector. The shader effector controls the color of the lights. It is mapped using flat mapping onto the cloner object and that texture tag is used in the shader effector. Therefore we are going to have red and blue lights according to the gradient in the material. The delay effector is merely meant to dampen somewhat the erratic motion of the lights when they sweep around. All other parameters are linked again using Expresso. 
when we open up the Expresso editor, you can see that we have linked the rotation along the pitch and heading axes and also the outer angle of the light. In the next step I'm going to show you a simple way how to incorporate other motion into your effector driven motion. When I play my scene you can see that my cube jumps around somehow but it also seems to have a very regular periodic movement. You will also notice that for this example I'm not using any cloners or other MoGraph tools at all. It's all done using Expresso. Let's dissect our expression and see what it actually does. You can clearly see that there are two distinct parts. Let me disable the upper part and only use the lower chain of nodes. You can see that this constitutes motion based on our sound. Let's turn this around, relink our upper part and disable our lower part. You can see that this is some kind of regular wave pattern. It is not very pronounced, so to bring it out more, let me twirl up some values. To control everything, I have added user data to my nil object. This is a simple way to feed values into an expression without actually opening the editor. So let me increase the amplitude and you can see that it's now much more noticeable. When I also up the frequency, our soft wavy movement becomes more like a quick hammering. When I combine both parts of the expression, their values are combined as well. Using my user data, I can still control everything. And since user data itself can also be animated, you could gain another level of animation control. Let's open the Expresso editor again and see what each node does. In the top left corner, you can see our nil object with its user data exposed. There is also a time node. The time and the frequency of our regular motion are multiplied. The output of that are values that get incrementally larger as time progresses. Those values are then fed into a trigonometric node where they will be interpreted as angles. Based on that info, our trigonometric node will calculate radian values which are cyclic for every 180 degree turn. Since those values are always between minus 1 and 1, they are of course again far too small to show up. Therefore we need to intensify them, which I do here using a range map. The maximum output is defined by the amplitude we are defining in our user data on the nil object. Once we have that, our sound driven values are multiplied with our regular movement to form the final movement. Another way to get regular movement is to use the beat shader. As the name indicates, it is meant to create shading effects such as blinking surfaces in regular intervals. However, there is nothing that stops us from using it with Expresso as well. First let's take a look at our scene. Once more I have a simple cube that is linked to the shader effector using Expresso. More on the Expresso itself later on. The shader effector uses a material that I have created using the beat shader. The material is applied to the nil object because it doesn't need to show up anywhere. It is only used by the shader effector as a reference. When we select the beats material in the material manager, you can see that I have turned off all other channels. I'm only working on the luminance channel, which is also the one I'm using on the shader effector. To get clean values out of my beat shader, I have nested it inside a colorizer. In case of the luminance channel, you could forego this step, but since we want perfect control over everything, we take a clean approach to this. If you don't practice those things until they are a habit, it's always possible you forget them and then you are screwed. When we click on the beat shader, a rather simple panel pops up. It mainly consists of a spline curve panel and two other controls. The first setting is the beats per minute. It defines how often per minute a certain rhythmic pattern occurs. Tie your animation to real music, you will use regular values like 120, 160 or 210 beats per minute. For our purposes, let's not concern us with that. The peak range defines how strong the effect is. Do not forget, this is meant to be a shader, so when the peak range would be lower, the changes in color or luminosity would be very subtle. As I already pointed out, the most important control is the spline curve itself. This defines the actual pattern. Just for fun, let's create something that looks like a triple hit. When we play our scene, you can see the cube doing three short jumps and then having a pause. This is because the beats shader works on real time units and calculates the actual occurrence of the beats based on that. When we use other spline shapes, the behavior of the cube of course changes. So how goes it all together? 
I don't think I need to explain the two left mode nodes. Since we are working with a shader effector, we need of course to know its output color, and that's where things get interesting. The shader itself uses RGB color. In our case, this still would not pose any problem, because we are using clean black and white values. This means that each color component has the same luminosity anyways. However, it's not unlikely that you are using other colors at some point. So just as a safety measure, add a color space node in between. This will convert our colors from RGB to HSV. After that, I'm feeding the converted colors in yet another conversion node. Our color still consists of three components encoded as vectors. We need to separate them. That's exactly what this node does. Do not go looking for a color components node. It's a simple vector to real operator. I've just renamed the node and I've also renamed the output ports. For our example, the relevant port is the value, which equals to the luminosity. This value has again a range between 0 and 1, so we need to use a range mapper to boost it. Boosted values can then be linked to the cube's global position. The next scenario may look a bit strange to many of you. We are linking one effector to another effector. You may ask, what's the point? Remember guys, it's all about control, and this setup exactly gives us that. By driving one effector with another effector, we gain an extra level of control. Let me explain. When I play my scene, you can see my clones twisting around the y-axis, and in addition to that, are also scaling. When you look at the cloner, you see that it is only driven by the step effector, yet everything our clones do is driven by the music. Just like any other object, you can drive the internal parameters of an effector using another effector. At first sight, this sounds somewhat like going against the principle of MoGraph. If you approach this logically, you would think that to achieve more control, you would simply just add more effectors. That's true of course, but think of it, we are dealing with sound. Not only do things become more complex the more effectors you use, but in case of sound, they also become more confusing. As I already mentioned, when you have multiple sound effectors in a scene, their playback can become unclean. In addition to that, why bother with multiple effectors when you can have the same result with one? Just like you would link normal objects, use a sample effector node and some range mappers to drive parameters in another effector. And what's with that extra level of control? It's already there. As you have seen on our step effector, rotation and scale are driven by the sound effector. However, I'm still free to adjust the spline curve on the step effector as well as other settings completely to my taste. So without even going to the sound effector, I can control parameters in my cloner object. An added bonus is that I'm still free to use fall off separately. So in our scenario this means our rotation is driven by the sound effector, yet I can further limit it by the parameters of the step effector, and on top of that I can apply a fall off, so it doesn't affect all clones. That's what I call control. If you were to add even more effectors to the same cloner, the advantage would become even more obvious. So I suggest we simply try it. Create a scene full of step effectors or whatever and let them drive by only one sound effect. You will have lots of fun seeing how you can drive literally each clone individually using its own step effector without inflicting the sound driven bass animation. Just like you can use shaders to drive other parameters, this of course works both ways. In addition to the beat shader, you can link all aspects of your materials to the sound effector using Expresso. This means you can create any sort of blinking, drive texture parameters or simply change colors, the latter being known as mood lighting. For illustration purposes I have again a simple cube to which my material is applied. When I let my scene play, you can see that certain hits in my sound give it a bluish tint. Let's elaborate how it is done. The bluish tint is hidden in the luminance channel. When I scrub through my timeline, you can see that the color changes as well as the overall brightness. Let's open up the Expresso editor. No more words on our two standard nodes on the left side, and I also don't think I need to explain the range mapper, 
but let's see what our rightmost notebox represents. At first sight, one could think it's just a normal object, but of course it isn't. I've simply used the same name for my cube and the material on the cube, so it's a bit confusing. If you build your own projects, you probably should give your materials different names or some prefix or suffix to make them distinct from the normal objects. So how do we get our material channels in the Expresso editor? Once again, simple drag and drop will do. However, though it is stated in the manual, many people are forever confused how to do it. It is not quite clear what to drag and drop. It's the tiny little preview icon in the top left corner of the attribute manager. Remember that you cannot drag and drop material channels directly, nor can you get their various parameters inside the Expresso editor this way. Because materials can have any number of textures, by default they have no ports in the Expresso editor. You always have to manually bring them out. For our example, let's use the base color. Simply drag the color output of the sound effector node to the color input of the cube material. That's pretty much it. With my connections now in place, I can use the color controls and the sound effector to control the color of my cube. You can see that when I now scrub the timeline, my cube will turn blue entirely and when I change my effector color, it will also respond to that. The luminance channel of course is also still tied to that. Next on the list is what I would call the visibility paradox. Yes, this is kind of a strange phenomenon. As you may recall if you have been following this series closely, by using the modify clone option combined with the visibility checkbox in the other section of the effector parameters, you can effectively make clones hide and appear at a whim of yours. I have done so in my scene and what I actually want is to have some VU meter or equalizer like appearing and disappearing clones. Now one would expect that this is quite simple using the sound effector, but as you can see on the screen you don't see anything. That is somewhat puzzling, because everything else in the scene seems to be set up correctly. My sound effect is set up properly and we can verify that when we turn off visibility and activate another parameter. Just as we would expect, our clones are reacting to that. So obviously we need some sort of workaround. The workaround for us is a combination of techniques we have previously explored. To control the visibility, we are going to use a shader effector and in turn to control where this visibility is triggered, we are using a material which is driven by the sound effector. This is a bit awkward but inevitable, otherwise you cannot control everything. We really need the material because we need to control the texture placement. On my sound effector the visibility option is still enabled. Since we already know that it doesn't work, let's disable it. You can see that I have referenced my texture tag which is applied to the cloner object. The texture tag uses a material which I have called filter mat. When we go to the Expresso editor, we can see a setup similar to the one we had in the previous section. On the right side, you can find a node which is called filter. This is a filter shader which we are using inside our material. To find out where it is located, let's look at our material. You see that I have used a layer material. This layered material again is composed of a gradient and our filter node. The filter node is applied in additive mode. Why is that? To control the visibility, I'm using a grayscale gradient. For lack of a better term, this defines our base visibility. So where there's the gray, our clones should be visible, so where there's the black, they should be completely gone. By applying the filter layer in additive mode, it will only brighten our gradient. It will never make it darker. This is important. Using Expresso, I have connected the lightness of the filter layer to my sound effector. Whenever the volume increases, the brightness of the filter layer increases. Now imagine the combined output of both layers and you will see that it all makes sense. Whenever the volume gets louder, our gradient gets brighter, meaning more clones will appear. By tweaking the gradient itself, you can change the number of clones that never disappear and are permanently visible. The only thing you now need to take care of is to align your texture properly with your clones. The easiest way to align it with all my clones is either to find a section where all clones are visible 
or to temporarily turn off the sound effector. When all clones are visible, you can then simply use the align texture to object option and include all sub objects. This will perfectly line everything up. A practical application of this technique is the equalizer city animation you can view on the main page and which you also get as a download. It contains multiple VU meters and each of them has its own sound effector and filter material. I have been warning you about potential audio feedback problems when you use multiple sound effectors in previous sections and now is the time to prove my words. When I scrub through my scene with all sound effectors enabled, it sounds awful. This is a simple performance problem. Each sound effector tries to play its own sound and in addition to that, your computer needs to draw the scene. This leads to multiple pieces from different sounds overlapping, which is of course no way to work. So to somewhat better the situation, either temporarily turn off all sound effectors you don't need, or at least turn off their scrub sound option. Lastly, one thing you mustn't forget is to bake all your clones. This is essential, especially when applying trickery such as we do. Of course it's also a way to make your scenes leaner. Yes, they will have the cache attached and be bigger in file size, but once you have baked everything, you can really strip your sound effectors and all the rest and have much less convoluted scenes for rendering. Just make sure you don't ditch your interactive scenes entirely and always have a version to go back to, in case you need to change something. With all that working with sound, you may at some point want to use some waveform-like structures. This can be easily achieved in a variety of ways, so let me explain them to you. The first and simplest of them all is to use the tracer object, which comes with MoGraph. In the scene on the screen, I'm using a simple linear cloner to which I have applied the sound effector in step mode. Inside the cloner I'm using a dummy sphere, which defines the actual position of the points. When you are doing this, you would probably use a matrix object, because actually you don't need any geometry to define the position of the points. For this article it's just easier to understand, if you have something to see. In addition to the sound effector, I have applied a delay effector, to get some lagging. In my tracer, I'm using the cloner object with my connect elements option enabled. I can then put it inside any object that uses splines. In my case, a simple sweep nerves that forms our tube. That's pretty much it. With that you have a waveform life structure that is dynamically generated. As you will notice there is already a baked MoGraph cache tag on my cloner object. Just like in the previous scenario, it is crucial that you bake all positions of your clones. Otherwise you will end up with completely straight splines that do not react to your music. Another way to make your splines react to music is to use standard splines and access their points with Expresso. For a simple straight spline, such as we are using it, this is of course not very sensible. The tracer does the job just as well. However, it can happen that you have a predefined spline shape and need to modify the points based on sound. The tracer in those situations may not always work. So I'm providing you with a template how you can access points on splines and modify them. In MoGraph there's a special data node to get info from cloners and other objects. This is what we are using here. First, we are using one instance of this node to get the number of clones. We are feeding this inside an iteration node to define the end of our iteration. The output of the iteration is connected to another data node, where it will define the index of the clone to be used. Then the position of that clone is fed into the point position, where the iteration defines which point is actually affected. Now you can expand on that basic chain of nodes. Depending on your scenario, you may for instance only want to affect a certain point range, which you could do by limiting the iteration range. Or you may have created a star-like shape and you only want to affect the tips of the stars. In that case you would use a modulo with a factor of 2 and only every second point representing the tips of your stars would be affected. There is a whole plethora of uses and this is really only the starting point. Once you have decided on a way how to affect your splines, you are of course free to use any other MoGraph tools to refine your setup. In this example, I'm applying the sound effector to all clones uniformly and using a fall off, it is forming a spike. Let me clear the cache and change my spline shape a little. You see that the arrangement of my spline points reacts to that. 
once you have taken the hurdle of making your splines react to sound, it is of course easy to use them with tools such as hair. To do so, you simply drag the spline into the points link reference field in the editing section of the hair guides. Now your hair will react to the music, including all variations you have defined elsewhere. When you remove the points link, it will behave just like normal hair. One application of that may be that you have your hair as dancing vines. You could also use our scene as it is now, render it, and then using some blurs and other post-processing techniques, make it look like dancing fire. As a last, more complex example of the use of the sound effector, I have created a loudspeaker. This uses pretty complex expresso, and I'm not going to explain everything, so if you're interested, spend some time and analyze it yourself. I have modeled a few simple components, including the casing, and the magnetic coil housing, as well as the central emitter. The membrane is created dynamically using a loft nerves object. As a finesse, I have introduced some stair steps. On real loudspeakers, this is used to break the energy of the membrane swinging, so it doesn't transfer the energy to the housing of the loudspeaker and your boxes do not jump around in your flat. Those stair steps can be adjusted using some user data, so you can have them appear in different places. Usually on the real thing, they are pretty close to the emitter in the center. The placement of the stair steps is largely defined by Expresso code. Only the circle at the edge and the circle at the emitter are placed manually. The rest is calculated. Inside the loft knobs object, only their stacking order in the object manager matters. Just as with any other loft knobs objects, they need of course to have a certain sequence to form a smooth surface. When I scrub my timeline, you will also notice that the movement gets less pronounced towards the top. This is also handled by the Expresso code. So let's take a look at it. In this particular example, the sound effector only drives the position of the emitter. The range mapper defines the elongation along the y-axis. This position is then used in various places inside the expression. Let me just give you a quick overview. I have color coded some parts, so it should be easier for you to follow. The yellow node only contains our user data. This is the stair step end and stair step start. The output on the right side is colored green. These are all in between circles. If you want to add more in between circles, watch out for the two orange nodes. Those are link lists that contain the references to the in between circles. Just like the loft knobs itself, the stacking order inside the link list is of some importance. So in case you add more in-betweens and something looks wrong, just check there. The math itself is mostly about finding differences between inner and outer circles, dividing those differences in segments, this differential info with some multipliers figured in. I've placed various parts of the code inside separate X groups, so to open them up, just double click. The first is the difference calculation for the height between the edge circle and the emitter circle. We are calculating the absolute difference and then using the percentages defined in the user data, we are limiting the range to be used in successive calculations. The intensity multiplier will do what it says. It's responsible for making the vibrations less pronounced the closer the circle is to the outer edge of the loudspeaker. The iteration offset is required for the stair stepping, otherwise it wouldn't look correct. Just like we are calculating the difference in height, we are also calculating of course the difference in radius. After we have calculated everything, it all comes together in the blue and red node chains. It is either added again or multiplied. That's pretty much it. But like I said, it's best for you if you study everything yourself and wrap your brain around it. I have used my loudspeaker in another scene, of which you can also see a rendered animation on the main page. It uses a cloner, it distributes our loudspeaker across a sphere, and the random effector is only changing the sizes of each loudspeaker. Because everything is connected with Expresso, you do not need to take any additional steps. When you have rendered some pretty pictures moving to sound, you may wish to complement them with other elements. For this you usually use either an editing program or a compositing program. As you may well know, I am somewhat of an After Effects buff, so let's use that. There is a plugin very similar to the sound effector in MoGraph. It is called Sound Keys and has been around quite a while. It's 
based on the same principles and can be handled in a similar fashion. For this demo, I'm using a simple lens flare, which is rendered using null light factory. The lens flare is on a separate layer and has few parameters to adjust. We will be interested in changing the brightness of the flare based on sound. So how do we set it up? I have created another layer to which I'm going to apply my sound keys plugin. Let's find it in our effects and presets palette. When you apply sound keys to a layer, it will draw its spectrum grid. Initially, this grid is blank. Though sound exports among you will notice that the grid it uses is logarithmic. Just like in the sound effector in MoGraph, we need of course to assign a sound file. When we now scrub the timeline, we can see our various frequency bands being drawn. When we create a RAM preview, you can see the spectrum changing in accord with the music. Initially, the readout is a bit flat, so let's try and boost it. This can be done for all bands uniformly using the scale option. Find a part where the music is really loud and dial in some suitable settings. More than 6 is way too much, so let's settle for 2. In addition to boosting frequency bands uniformly, you can do so for each range separately using the other options. So if your bass is not strong enough for your purposes, just dial up the control. A parameter that cannot be found in MoGraph, but certainly would be useful sometimes, is the smoothness. This will blend all frequency bands that are not as loud as the loudest peak, resulting in a smooth curve. Of course, again you have the choice to use only one channel in a stereo file. Each instance of sound keys can have three output ranges. The output ranges are the values that you can then use in other plugins. Since we only have one other effect and only want to drive one parameter, one range will do just fine. Unlike in the sound effector, to adjust the range being used, you simply drag around the crosshairs and the box they form. The effective output is reflected by the bar on the right. Unlike in the sound effector, the default setting for the output is the average of the range. Remember, in the sound effector it's the peaks. Of course you can change that. If you want to use the peaks, just select them from the rolldown. The switch setting you can find in the sound effector is called trigger in sound keys. It also turns on and off effects as soon as a peak is inside the range. By defining a range and choosing a sampling method, we already have a basic setup that works. So let's hit the apply button and generate keyframes. This is a major difference to the sound effector. In sound keys you always need to bake your keyframes. This is not the fault of sound keys, this is a limitation in after effects. So be aware that when you change any parameters in sound keys, you have to hit the apply button again. Once we have generated our keyframes, there are two options how to proceed. Either you copy your keyframes and paste them onto the parameter you want to modify, or you link them using expressions. Because we are going to tweak a few values, we are choosing the expression method. Let's lock the effects palette for sound keys and bring up another one for our lens flare. On the brightness parameter, click on the stopwatch while holding down the ALT key. This will add an expression to any parameter in After Effects. The expression code will already be highlighted in the timeline. Using the pick whip, we can now connect it to the output of the sound keys. Let's do a RAM preview and see what we have. Our lens flare is now already blinking to the music. It just doesn't look right. Let's go back and change a few settings. The first thing we need is some kind of fall off. Here sound keys offers a few more options than the sound effector. Not only can you choose between having fall off at all, but you can also choose between different types. The most natural one is exponential fall off. This means the fall off is initially faster, but gets slower the more time has passed. In case of our lens flare this is just right. The brightness will fade away quickly, but the flare itself will be visible for quite some time before it gets entirely dark. Let's do another RAM preview to verify. In our setup we have also used the default output minimum and maximum values, which are 0 and 100. Depending on what type of effect you want to drive, you may choose other values. I am selecting custom here because I want the light to never go out. I also want it to be much brighter at the maximums. 30 and 150% respectively are just right. A 
a setting unique to sound keys is the none fall off. This means whenever sound triggers an effect, its values will add up. In our example, the lens flare will get brighter with each hit and then never fade away again. Of course, it's getting too bright too fast because we have a rather large range. So in that case, you would need much more subtle settings to make it believable. For this demo, more or less out of sheer luck, I have found the right frequency band that contained my hits. I can use my sound keys output to drive my lens flare without problems. However, it can happen that for the life of you, you cannot find the right frequencies using those tools. In that case, I suggest you do a normal RAM preview. While that RAM preview is playing, hit the asterisk or multiply key on your numerical area on your keyboard. This will interactively add layer markers where you want them. These could then at least be used to manually keyframe your values. Well, my friends, that is the end of our series on MoGraph. I've had lots of fun putting it together and really enjoyed it. Of course, there's no denying that I had lots of stress also, but it's been fun nonetheless. I hope that in my articles, which now comprise more than three hours of knowledge, I could provide some insights and tips for you and you had as much fun watching it as I had doing them. Thank you for all your time and support. Have a nice Christmas and a happy new year and come back next year. Until then, bye bye.